Good evening, and welcome to Mission Possible, a bite-sized moose-bouche of education and entertainment about how we can create a delectable mix of art and enterprise in pursuit of a zero carbon world. Welcome. I'm Alistair McPherson, I'm the Chief Executive of Plymouth Energy Community, and that, that side or that side, me is Paul Harbin, my co-host and the brains behind this operation. I want to, uh, tonight is, um, remind everyone that tonight is part of Plymouth Social Enterprise Festival. It's a week-long celebration and exploration of how purpose-led businesses can help educate the economy on the ways that we can build back better. Each year as part of this festival, Plymouth Energy Community endeavours to bring together our members, our friends, investors, supporters, and anyone else that will come to celebrate what we are collectively achieving here in Plymouth and to take inspiration from those that are doing great things further afield. So this year we've partnered with the University of Plymouth Sustainable Earth Institute and without them none of this magic would be happening. My role and Paul's role is to play um, host for the evening and steer you through um, our 90 minutes of fun. Um, initially there's a bit of housekeeping that I just want to do. So firstly, if there is a fire alarm, I'm not expecting any, but if you have one, I suggest you take it seriously. Toilets, I believe they're in the same place you left them. Importantly, we have a chat function. So I should be on the right-hand side of your screen. And um, please put any questions you have in there. And my colleague, Chris, will be collating those and grilling the presenters with them afterwards. Um, recording, we are recording this event and we'll be sharing a link for you to be able to view that and share that with your parents, friends, colleagues, um, enemies, if you wish, afterwards. So please, um, uh, yeah, share afterwards. So just as a little bit of context and to set the scene, I guess I'd like to say that after the hope of 2018, 19, the raised awareness around climate change, the rebels, the occupation of central London, climate emergency declarations, Greta, school strikes. It might be easy to feel gloomy as if one type of global emergency had been supplanted by another in the headlines. But we really believe the change is coming and that there are many reasons to be optimistic. This zero carbon mission is entirely possible, but we will need to both, both creative and innovative to make it happen. And so to ensure we keep that belief front and center, we have assembled for your delectation, 90 minutes of the most glass half full kind of people we could find. So tonight, we're gonna to be hearing from the Sustainable Earth Institute, one of the brand's new low carbon Devon project and its support and about its support for SMEs. From the wonderful Jenny Ayrton and the amazing Art and Energy Collective. A bit from Plymouth Energy Community and the legend that is Ed Gillespie. So without further ado, I want to pass over to Paul, who's going to give Ed the introduction that he deserves. Thank you, Paul. Fantastic. Thanks, Al. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Hardman, and I'm manager of the Sustainable Earth Institute at the University of Plymouth. At the Institute, we have run a number of public talks over the years, welcoming various big thinkers, people who can provoke, challenge and inspire. Today's keynote speaker, Ed Gillespie, fits slap bang in that category. Ed is a climate positive adventurer, environmental entrepreneur, director of Greenpeace, author, podcaster and poet. Ed is going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll have a few questions. So please submit your questions into the chat box. Personally, I've always been inspired after hearing Ed talk and I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. So Ed, over to you. A good evening, everyone. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to be covering these three very small topics of art, environment and business. Uh, and trying to do that in 30 minutes. So I will dive straight in. Uh, we are all uh, probably aware of this little thing uh, called coronavirus and COVID-19, which has been uh, 
challenging us, let's say, for the last nine months or so. Uh, and it's interesting because the world in many ways will never be uh, the same as it was before uh, this little adventure. If you go back to last year, uh, offering free hugs on the street would have made you an empathetic human being, uh, a lovely person to be around. In 2020, it makes you look like a sociopath. So, so many of the rules of engagement have been rewritten um, over the last uh, nine months or so. But also, this is a foreseeable challenge. Uh, as astronomer Royal Martin Rees said in 2015, he said, our interconnected world is so vulnerable that our hospitals uh, and health services would be overwhelmed even when the mortality rate was a fraction of 1% uh, and how right he was. So he was saying this five years ago uh, and equally the All England Lord Tennis Club at Wimbledon uh, had been quite merrily paying a £1 million pound a month, a uh, £1 million pound a year insurance against the pandemic and its impact, which had just happily paid out uh, a hundred million pound dividend to compensate for the lack of the TS tournament. So we could see this coming in many ways. And I think uh, following up from what we were saying in the introduction, this is the apocalypse and uh, not in terms of the end of the world, but perhaps the end of the world as we knew it. Uh, and the full derivation of that word apocalypse, which is the pulling back of the veil, the revealing, the exposure of the pipework underneath, the stuff uh, that's really going on under the surface has all been thrown into stark and illuminated light uh, by the events of the last uh, nine months. Uh, I talk about this a lot with my colleague Dougal Hine in a podcast we do called The Great Humbling, which asks the question, well, what would happen if we embrace the challenges we face with a degree of humility? What happens if we were to take this in a very grounded way to bring ourselves literally back to earth? Um, and those conversations have been uh, amazing because it's in stark contrast, if you like, to the, the kind of hubris and the arrogance of trying to get through this without learning anything. Because let's face it, this cartoon by Tom Toro from The New Yorker with the ragged trousered businessman saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. It is awkwardly funny because it's at least partly true. So we are faced with the challenge of having to redefine what prosperity means beyond simple economic growth into a notion of genuine flourishing and thriving. Uh, and that, if you like, is where these worlds all come together, the worlds of art uh, and climate and enterprise. Because we're very good as human beings at the laws of unintended consequences. Uh, I always use this example, which is the invention of the tin can, which is a brilliant um, innovation in terms of the storage, preservation and transportation of perishable foodstuffs. Uh, sadly, it took 38 years, though, between the invention of the tin can and the invention of the can opener. So even with a brilliant, well-intended innovation, we often have 38 years of uh, an interim period where people were opening these things with hammers and chisels and knives and lacerating themselves horrifically in, in the process. And so what we have to try and do is to stretch the imagination of the possible, which is what uh, I also do in my other podcast with uh, comedian John Richardson and fellow reluctant futurist Mark Stevenson, because we say... Being a futurist is not about predicting and analyzing the trends to, to try and uh, soothsay where we might be headed. But the job of a futurist is to stretch that imagination of the possibility, which is where the role of art and culture is absolutely critical. Because we also know, and thankfully we might hopefully be saying uh, goodbye to he who shall not be named in the White House, um, if he can ever concede the election and not have to be removed from the premises uh, by the armed forces. But I, I love this image because I think it sums up so many of the tensions we're currently trying to traverse, which is uh, an intergenerational tension uh, between Greta Thunberg here uh, and Donald, uh, and also a gender tension and also a worldview tension about the way we see the way the planet works. Because small things can make a difference. Uh, we're not just in the kind of territory of being left alone in a room with a mosquito. Uh, we're here, whoever said one person can't change the world never ate an undercooked bat which we might be regretting uh, in hindsight. Uh, and we've alluded to the fact that this is not a drill and the role of Extinction Rebellion in bringing um, the climate emergency onto the agenda. Uh, and I think for me, the tipping point really began to happen as someone who'd worked on climate change for 20 years uh, was the Australian fires, where the scale of those fires, when an area the size of Austria burnt, a billion animals were killed, 
thousands of homes were destroyed, hundreds of people uh, displaced from their homes in the teeth of these fires. And I remember seeing a comment on Facebook where someone saying, look, it's not climate change, it's just heat and drought and fires. So you can try and unpick the cognitive dissonance uh, behind that one phrase. There's probably a PhD in it. Equally, our political leadership has been found somewhat wanting. This is Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, standing up in the Australian Parliament saying, this is coal, don't be afraid, don't be scared. Uh, but in actual fact, we really should be, because what we're seeing is these non-linear impacts of climate change start to unfold in a way which is genuinely disturbing uh, for those of us who have watched the kind of the long, slow car crash of the climate crisis. Uh, and in particular, what happened in Australia, these pyrocumulonimbus nimbus clouds which are essentially firestorms that are so intense, they start to generate their own weather um, and then obviously create highly charged clouds, which generate lightning, which then trigger more fires. So you essentially have a self seeding fire. Uh, and if you want to know what these look like, this is actually a photo from Mount Tal in the Philippines, a volcano which erupted last year. Uh, and this is not a CGI image. This is actually an image of a highly charged volcanic cloud creating its own lightning, which is what we're now seeing in these pyrocumulonimbus type effects. So I put it to you that actually what we're telling ourselves is three comfortable myths. One, that we feel that like we know what's going on and what's likely to happen in the next five to 15 years. Uh, secondly, we have a sense of control and that whatever happens, we'll find a way to tame it. Uh, and thirdly, we understand the leadership that will be required and are confident that our institutions are up to it. And I would put it to you that those are three very co comfortable myths. Because what we've seen in Australia is these simple linear predictable trends combining through tipping points to create complex, non-linear, exponential and chaotic outcomes. Now, this is serious stuff for those of us, again, who have watched this agenda unfold. Because if you take what happened in Australia, it was rising temperatures, it was increased drought and increased wind speeds and, and increased cuts in austerity cuts in fire and forestry services. Now that's important because those are all simple, linear, predictable trends, combining through tipping points to create these rapidly converging multiple megafires, uh, which spread themselves, as I said before. And as climate scientist Michael Mann said, this is not in the models. This is not the stuff that we were anticipating happening and certainly not something we we're anticipating happening in the immediate coming few years. And I gave a workshop um, at the Bank of England in January this year where we looked at these high impact but low likelihood events. Uh, and we were talking about extreme climate change and nonlinear risks. But actually, we also touched on pandemics and economic crises. And now we have all three at the same time. And we all know about flattening the curve in terms of COVID-19, where we're trying to bring the number of cases below the carrying capacity of the healthcare system with the protective measures like the lockdown that we're currently experiencing. Uh, but equally, you could apply the same kind of flattening the curve logic to climate change, where we're trying to use the right measures to bring uh, the shift in temperature below two degrees or towards the Paris Agreement's one and a half. And so... We can also look at this in more broadly in terms of the context of sustainability, where actually we're just trying to bring all of these systems, whether it's climate change, whether it's regenerative agriculture, whether it's plastic packaging and pollution within the Earth's carrying capacity. So on the flipping of that, I would say actually what we're facing is three key uncomfortable truths that we're facing unknown unknowns um, and those unknown unknowns need to be comprehended as much as is possible. The fact that we are very much not in control. And it would be actually slightly arrogant to assume that we might be. And thirdly, that leadership is just part of the mix for responsible organising, which is why grassroots initiatives and local level activity is absolutely fundamental and should never be discounted uh, or dismissed. Because you might have also seen the headlines in the papers today about um, global aviation, where it's showing that 50 percent of global aviation emissions come from one percent of the population and their massive frequent flying habits. But the same principle applies when you look at carbon emissions overall. It's the top 10% uh, of the world's population that are responsible for 49% of global emissions. So this is also not a population issue, it's a consumption issue. And it's a consumption issue in a small part of the world, which is driving the bulk of emissions. So climate change is a threat multiplier, uh, and you don't need me to tell you it's possibly the greatest risk management failure in history, because we've obviously seen this coming towards us with a grim predictability uh, for quite some time. 
But equally, this is not the moment to flip from going, hey, it's not real to, okay, it's real. It's just not caused by us. So, oops, to, pardon the French, the F word. Um, if there's any children out there listening, I will try not to swear. Uh, but we can't afford just to tip into that despondency. But it's not just me saying this. It's not just Greenpeace. It's not just Extinction Rebellion. Um, this is also coming from the military. So the Ministry of Defence, the highest impact, most likely strategic risk is the failure to uh, engage and mitigate on climate change. Um, and also the World Economic Forum's global risk landscape paints a very similar picture. Highest impact, highest likelihood, major strategic risk is climate change. So this is the military, this is business, uh, as well as all the campaigning NGOs that you might expect to be in this space who are giving us a very similar message. So as we said at the beginning, you know, this is an emergency uh, and we need to be treating it as such uh, and trying to engage in it. Now, remedying, obviously, this in a systemic fashion is not going to come for free. Uh, but as the dinosaurs were considering 66 million years ago, maybe the asteroid mitigation program that they were exploring at the time uh, might have been a worthwhile investment to eliminate uh, their initial demise. Because these risks are all connected. Uh, you know, and COVID-19, many people are describing as essentially a dry run for the type of disruption that we might see coming down the track towards us. We've got the economic recession having lost 20% of GDP uh, this year, which is going to be coming immediately on the back of this. Then we have the even bigger wave of climate change and perhaps the, the even more scary wave of biodiversity collapse coming along behind. So as Professor Johan Rockstrom of the Stockholm Resilience Centre says, the planet is starting to send back invoices to the economy. Everything that we do now, which is not in a place where it's starting to ameliorate these effects, is essentially another additional cost rather than an investment for the future. And we're all part of this. You know, I think we're not stuck in traffic. We are traffic. Uh, we're all very quick to point the finger of blame. But actually, we're all responsible uh, to a greater or lesser extent, and particularly in the developed world. And so we have to be accountable uh, for that responsibility, particularly in the light of historic emissions, and start to take a radical step forward into the future we need. And that's not going to be easy. Um, I've just come off a call with my colleagues at the Forward Institute, where we work on responsible leadership. And one of our faculty there, Margaret Heffernan, says the truth won't set us free until we develop the skills, the habits, the talents, but perhaps most of all, the moral courage to use that truth and to use that truth effectively. Because essentially, our whole uh, world of sustainability endeavours is still a dam damage limitation exercise. It's only taken us closer to that central axis of the diagram here. Sustainability is about sustaining the status quo, maintaining business as usual in some way, shape or form. And actually, we need to make an even more radical step into a restorative and regenerative future, uh, where we're actually starting to enhance and improve the situation and that might involve removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, or perhaps regenerating, rejuvenating our ecological life support systems. So we must very much should think about sustainability as a stepping stone. It's just a transition pathway from what is a truly degenerative system into a properly, authentically regenerative one. And lots of businesses, uh, big businesses in particular, have led, uh, led the way. Uh, signing up to science-based targets. We have over 500 companies now globally trying to align their emissions portfolios and profiles with what is required uh, by the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And in many senses, that race to net zero is on. You know, no one's actually questioning the destination now, but everyone's having a huge argument about how fast we get there. Uh, and again, Extinction Rebellion and people were instrumental in framing that in the right way and saying 2040, 2050, way too late. We need to be talking about this by 2030 at the very latest. So you've seen lots of high street brands and big names uh, engaging in this. Sainsbury's is one of the more recent saying net zero by 2040, but still 20 years off. Uh, and whilst they've done great things, they've also ignored their scope three emissions, which if you know anything about scope one, two and three emissions, this is this is the big one. This is their supply chain. This is where all their food and products come from. So they're kind of missing a trick. On the flip side of that, you have the ambitions and aspirations of businesses like Microsoft, who are actually saying they're going to try uh, and remove all the carbon the company has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Now, clearly, that's ambitious. And I think we should be 
lauding these companies carefully because they're all seem to be engaged now in a race to the top. Although there are clearly some concerns and criticisms about how to navigate that particular net zero journey. Which brings us to the art world, because I had this quote on my office wall in the very early days of Futera back in Brixton uh, in the early noughties, uh, which said art is to the community what the dream is to the individual. Um, and we need to be trying to use the power of creative culture to share that societal dream, to actually create those positive visions of an attainable future. Because it is like a rallying cry. You know, we've gone from Lord Kitchener uh, and, you know, Uncle Sam to uh, Greta saying, your planet needs you. Uh, and we need to understand that her message and the message of that Fridays for F uh, Future movement and the school children and school strikes movement is incredibly potent. It's also leading to all sorts of the right type of pester power of, of leaders uh, and, and senior people. Plus, we need to be making the landmarks here. Uh, this is the, the plaque that was put onto uh, an Icelandic glacier last summer, which is saying the Ock Glacier, um, which is the first glacier to lose its status as a glacier. And they say, in the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you in the future know if we did it. Uh, and I think these things are important because, as Naomi Klein says, art and creativity are absolutely central to winning and sustaining people. This is going to be hard work. And we need to feed people culturally as full human beings and feed their spirits because art keeps people in movements because it gives us moments of beauty, release and community. That is the fundamental role uh, of art. And we've seen through the kind of eyes of culture declares emergency why the levers of culture are so important because culture convenes culture renews and transforms it allows us to speak differently and disrupt the status quo it builds capacities for action through inclusivity and participation and also lets us learn in this great reimagining um, and that's absolutely going to be the lodestone for how we move forward <clears throat> because some of the some of the kind of cultural resonances here are quite difficult Excuse me. <clears throat> um, we're in many ways, we're hardwired uh, to see melting as a good thing. Uh, I think, you know, the symbolism of melting ice caps is, is a bit ambiguous because obviously the melting of ice tends to signify the rejuvenation of spring, the end of the winter hardship. Um, and at the same time, we're also hardwired to like the idea of growth. I mean, growing is good, but nothing should be growing infinitely so we have to play around with some of these metaphors and one of the people i turn to when i'm trying to explore the darkness of this moment and actually the grief that we're having to work our way through collectively um is joanna macy uh, who talks about this as the great turning and she said it's a dark time it's filled with suffering and uncertainty you know it's natural that we feel the trauma of the world in some way you know that's not abnormal perhaps if you're not upset and angry, you're really just not paying attention. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. The critical thing is not to turn that anger into blame, but to turn it into a positive force for action. And, and in The Great Turning, Joanna Macy talks about three different focuses of where you can be in this time. One at the bottom there is obviously the shift in consciousness and values. So seeing things in a perhaps the more sacred or, or spiritual lens. So learning from both new science and ancient wisdom. Then there's the holding actions, the resisting, the slowing down of the destruction. And then there's the creation of alternative structures, new patterns of organizing, new ways of doing things. Uh, and culture underpins all of that. Uh, as the management consulting guru, Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, we can have every strategy we, in the world that we want, but actually, unless our culture is in support of that, and unless our culture is embracing those strategic changes, um, we are going to be lost. And I thought I'd include a few examples just of some of the great cultural interventions we've had. Liberate Tate has been one of uh, the most incisive. Uh, this is an arts campaigning group which has been very effective in actually removing BP sponsorship from some of our great cultural institutions. 
which uh, undermined their public license to operate because they use these things as a little bit of a fig leaf for some other activities. And this has included turning up and tarring and feathering um, glorious drinks parties on the terrace at Tate Modern. This is not real tar, by the way, it was molasses uh, before anyone starts to get uh, concerned. By creating art installations of bodies covered in oil within the galleries themselves, uh, by having the Reverend Billy turn up to, to perform an exorcism um, on, on the institution, uh, to my favourite, which was actually turning up to the turbine hall at Tate Modern uh, with a wind turbine blade uh, and gifting it to the, uh, to the, to the gallery as, a, as an installation. I think you can see the elegance and the cleverness and the creativity uh, and the participation that has gone into these big uh, events. They've also done other stuff, uh, uh, the National Portrait Gallery, where they read out the kind of parts per million uh, of carbon dioxide in the decades represented by the paintings in each room. This was a large sort of ensemble theatre piece within the gallery. Uh, and also, just to identify the, the kind of context of the relatively modest sum that BP was using, which is £274,000, uh, in order to get this kind of cultural kudos of association with some of our great cultural institutions. And as someone pointed out, that's about the cost of half a tooth in Damien Hirst's skull, which was called, if you remember, the love for the love of God, uh, which may be your, your reaction when learning that that skull is worth £50 million. Pounds. Uh, and one which my colleague, the director, executive director of Greenpeace UK, John Sovan, also participated in, was people having the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere in the year they were born tattooed somewhere on their body, um, perhaps as a, a really fantastic type of symbolic marker uh, of the pace of the change. And of course, we alluded to Extinction Rebellion and the role uh, perhaps of their artistic endeavours and very much embodying, if you like, those those, those different elements of what Joanna Macy was describing, the holding elements, the creation of new cultural possibilities and spaces, uh, and the shifts in spiritual awareness and consciousness. Uh, and we saw these red brigades engaging with the Metropolitan Police um, across London during those great protests. And the power of these images is, is quite extraordinary. There's something about the silence. There's something about the connection between these officers uh, and these activists, which is quite special. And obviously it resonates with some of the most iconic historic images like this one uh, during the Vietnam War in 1967 uh, of the students placing the marigolds down the barrels of the guns of the US National Guard. There are strong similarities across the decades of these types of actions, which is why the declaration of emergency from culture in terms of culture declares emergency has been such a critical part of the mix, if you like, of beginning uh, this process of transformation. Some of my own favorite historical examples were things like Oliver Eliasson's The Weather Project in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, which spoke to people, I think, of a sort of post-apocalyptic type of burning hot sun uh, and the relentless heat that might come through climate change. We've also got uh, Martin Creed's installation the infamous lights turning on and off again um which you know in some ways uh was not perhaps directly meant as a comment on climate change it may not be the kind of metaphor uh, we seek to illuminate um sorry pun intended but clearly there is something there about power cuts and about disruption to energy systems and another one which i also think was fantastic was uh, a kind of a walkable podcast called And While London Burns, which is an operatic audio tour across the city of London, which took you through spoken word and song around a map of the institutions which are actually driving a lot of the process uh, of carbon emissions and climate change. Perhaps more playfully, uh, you have people like Mark McGowan, uh, who had a project called The Running Tap in a, in a gallery in Camberwell in South London, where I used to live. Um, he just put on a tap and ran it constantly into a sink uh, during one of the biggest droughts of the early noughties in London, to absolute outrage. Um, and his point was, uh, before Thames Water actually literally threatened to cut off the water to the gallery, was uh, with the leakage in their pipes, we're already wasting uh, a vast uh, volume more than he was trying to do by raising awareness of our water profligacy. Uh, Mark then uh, rather more 
uh, <laughs> provocatively, then parked a car outside the gallery and ran uh, a hose pipe from the engine and the exhaust pipe whilst running the car uh, and filled the gallery with, with exhaust fumes. Again, making what was a rather far-sighted and ahead of his time commentary about urban air quality. Uh, again, met with outrage, but plenty of media coverage. Or Richard Box's field, uh, which is helping to make the invisible visible. Uh, these are your classic simple fluorescent tubes placed in the ground underneath uh, high energy voltage cables in, in your classic electricity pylons. And these are not plugged in. These tubes illuminate because of the electromagnetic fields being generated around those high voltage cables. So we are in many ways trying to bring the percentage and, and parts per million of a colorless, odorless gas into people's imaginations. And so we need to use these cultural ways of engaging to bring that through um, to the fore. Also about challenging use of public space. The space hijackers used to do some fantastic work in London on their circle line parties, helping people to realize and appreciate that this was our space, this was our public space. Uh, and they would bring literally hundreds of people, including a samba band onto tube carriages during rush hour uh, and create instant parties between stations uh, and then switch everything off before uh, they got to the next station. And when unwary commuters would then got on board and then as the train pulled out, the music would start up and the dancing would begin again. Um, and I think our protests can be beautiful. You know, I think the idea of clean graffiti, where we use high pressure water jets to create beautiful images against dirty concrete um, is also very hard to prosecute because you're actually just cleaning a dirty wall. Uh, you're just partially cleaning it in a creative and beautiful fashion. Um, or we can find ways of telling powerful stories. This is Simon Starling's uh, traversing of uh, a desert in Spain uh, on, a, on a fuel cell bicycle from which he collected all the emissions, which are essentially water vapor, as you will know. Um, and then he used the water he collected to paint watercolors of the cactuses and the plant life that he saw along the way. Equally, there's plenty of stuff in the written word. Uh, one of the most visceral books I've read on the subject of uh, you know possible collapse is Cormac McCarthy's The Road, where there's a repeating motif of the fact that we are carrying the fire. Uh, and I do think we need to be thinking about this in terms of a clock of the long now, because we're not going to be fixing climate change within our generation or within our children's generation. It's going to be an intergenerational challenge that we can't lose sight of. Uh, and two of the best books I read last year were The Overstory by Richard Powers, which is an absolutely profoundly beautiful book uh, about trees and our relationship with them and their relationship with the wider environmental crisis. And, and Robert McFarlane's Underland about what lies beneath everything from deep nuclear waste storage facilities to the fungal internet and the mycelium that unites all of the living things in our mature ecosystems uh, like old growth forests. And last but by no means least, uh, music declares emergency. Uh, you know, we need to get these guys mobilized and we're already starting to see obviously the obvious people like Radiohead, uh, but also the idols and various other musicians starting to commit to, well, no one's touring at the moment, but, you know, carbon neutral touring and very different ways of engaging uh, their audiences. And Michael Stipe, uh, former frontman of REM, also pledged to proceeds from his latest release to the Extinction Rebellion campaign. <coughs> so to conclude, you know, we don't want this all to be dystopian. I think it's very easy for us to play satire and protest with our creative forces. But what we actually really need to be seeing, as Peter Sellers, the theatre director, says, we should be at the centre of a society keeping alive a utopian vision, because society will not improve if the people envisioning it are, are, are politicians, because they will not take us out from the status quo. They will not take us and lead us away from the business as usual, which is leading us in fundamentally the wrong direction. Um, and one guy who does brilliant work on this is actually uh, a research scientist who works around renewable energy, James Mackay. You might have seen his work it comes out of the University of the Leeds, the man who draws the future. Uh, and I, he was brought to my attention by Rob Hopkins, the founder of Transition Towns, because the pictures that James Mackay draws are actually very tangible, accessible images of familiar street scenes, but it already representing the future that we might actually need. Um, and I think they're very accessible, they're very compelling, they're very inspirational, but also they're tangible. 
you can start to imagine yourself in them. They're not necessarily sci-fi ridiculous. They start to look practical in terms of green spaces, uh, in terms of localized mobility, um, and in terms of electrification. And I also thought, well, we should also mention business um, because it's obviously about enterprise. Uh, I do think purpose-driven businesses are going to be the ones that hopefully grow in the right way to fill the gap left in the wreckage behind some of the larger companies uh, which might break during this transition. Um, some of my favorite design work uh, is represented by people like Professor Jonathan Chapman, who talks about emotionally durable design. How do we create objects that we want to keep, that we actually build a relationship with, uh, which actually improve with age, like an old pair of jeans or the patina on a leather bag. Uh, and one of his best examples from one of his students is actually the teacup, which is only partially glazed on the inside, which means as you drink more tea, the tannins go into the ceramic and leave this beautiful pattern. So it's something which is enhanced by use, which builds a relationship to it, to the product or the object in a way that it kind of completely confronts head on this idea of inbuilt obsolescence or the throwaway society. Um, equally, the Japanese art of Kintsugi, where we might bring a broken object together. And in, in Kintsugi, is traditionally an object is mended with gold, which then makes the broken, restored object more beautiful than the original whole object. And I think as a metaphor for what we must do through the cracks which have opened up, in society, this is actually a nice way of thinking about it, a kind of kintsugi for culture. Or, and again, on the durability piece, uh, there's a wonderful website called Buy Me Once, which is about loving things that last, objects which are enduring. So why would you buy five saucepans over a lifetime when you should actually just try and find the money and buy the one that will see you through uh, your whole life? Uh, and I thought I'd throw in uh, a beer, because everyone loves beer. Uh, you might have seen BrewDog's new initiative around Make Earth Great Again. They've embarked on a process of double offsetting all of their emissions uh, by planting uh, 22 million or 2 million trees in Scotland by 2022, trying to draw this back and saying 2030 is too late. We're going to just go ahead and do it now. Um, and also just to show that you can tackle any challenge you want through your social enterprise if you have the gumption and the ambition. Uh, and this is Tony's Chocolonely, which has stepped into the incredibly contentious and controversial world of West African indentured slave labor on cocoa production uh, and, and tried to make that into a populist um, and, and accessible solution by buying into slave free chocolate. So it can be done. We can bring our creative cultural skills into the business world um, in order to try and change the bigger picture. So. In many ways, it can feel like we're facing breakdown. It can feel like we're coming up against the barriers uh, of a very difficult challenge. The solution to this is not going to be change as usual because that's just going to delay the impact of the place that we're coming to. What we really need is stuff that's going to break through, break through into the mainstream, break through into mainstream culture and break through into mainstream business. Because otherwise, if we go down the conventional route of building back better uh, or, or back to a new normal, um, it's a bit like Darth Vader saying the construction of our new Death Star is an amazing job creation opportunity. You know, yes, it is, Darth, but unfortunately, it also destroys planets. So we need to embrace a more embodied way of thinking about these things, which is not just about head and logic and rationale. It's about the compassion and kindness of the heart and the, and the visceral instinctive intuition of the gut. And I think that's the way we start to unlock the resistance because I am so exhausted of hearing people say, we want to, we've want to, got to save the planet. Uh, the planet does not want to be saved or rescued or even changed. The planet wants to be loved. It wants to be appreciated. It wants to be valued. Uh, and if we actually adopted that approach to the way that we interact with it, then we wouldn't need saving and it wouldn't need changing. It wouldn't need rescuing. And... I think the Japanese, again, in the Kintsugi mold, have the, one of the best models of thinking about this. Uh, and they talk about this as a reason for being, or ikigai, uh, which you may have seen before. But it, it's where you combine what you love with what you're good at, with what you could be paid for, with what the world needs. And there, that's the kind of the pure essence of life satisfaction. And I think we should all be striving to find our own ikigai um, wherever possible, because Right now, we've been in an impossible world for what feels like uh, almost a year now. Uh, and as XR have pointed out, only the impossible 
is interesting. We have done the impossible. We have all started working from home. We have all locked ourselves into our homes. All of things which would seem like madness, we wouldn't necessarily ever have done them voluntarily. But they've also shown that the impossible can be done. And that's why this is a brilliant rallying cry for what has to come next. Because even if, as I said, this is an intergenerational challenge and we're not going to solve it within our particular lifetimes, it still matters because every tonne of carbon that doesn't enter the atmosphere now alleviates future human suffering in some way, shape or form. So I will finish on this idea, which has actually been a thread which has run right back through to the 1960s, um, like the marigolds in the barrels of the guns of the National Guard and the anti-Vietnam protests. And it's gone through the, the pandemic, and now we're going to see it in the context of climate change, because essentially none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Uh, but we also have a unique opportunity at this strange and slightly bewildering moment in time for an amazing alignment to come together of arts, culture, environment and enterprise, which could help us navigate the territory ahead in ways which are satisfying, rewarding, inspiring and game changing. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Can you hear the round of applause? Oh, yeah, exactly. It is very strange. It is very strange. I was just talking to someone earlier uh, in, a, in a workshop where we were saying, what do you miss? You say, well, I sort of miss the audience because, you know, I'm still giving a lot of talks, but it's a very strange feeling talking to yourself in your own front room. Um, and, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll I can feel the warmth. I can feel the warmth. Good. Yeah, it's, it's coming, coming from the far southwest. Lots of love. Um, We've got some questions in the chat um, and my colleague Chris has been um, collating those questions and he's now going to fire them at you in a kind of Paxman-like kind of uh, manner. Chris? Is he going to ask, ask, ask the same question 13 times in a row? <laughs> until you answer it. <laughs> yeah, until I answer it. Great. Thanks, Ed. And thanks, Alistair. So, yeah, I'll just dive straight into the questions. So there's a question here about are we seeing an, uh, enough climate change or climate emergency and solutions within things like fiction, TV, film? What do you think about that? Uh, no, um, there's always room for more. I mean, I, so I think there's a whole genre which is emerging called solar punk. Um, there's people starting to write sort of solar punk sci-fi um, rather than steampunk, which is obviously putting renewable energy at the front and center of that. Um, BAFTA actually have a whole project uh, called Arthur, uh, which is all about the placement of pro-environmental behaviours uh, and actions uh, and products even into our creative industries. That's a bit too below the radar for my liking. And I think that's important in terms of some of the subliminal messaging. But I think you're right. There's still a huge opportunity for painting those better accessible positive visions of the future uh, in a way which is compelling. The trouble is dystopia tends to grab our attention more, tends to be more visceral, which is why, you know, people lurch towards uh, a Mad Max type of future rather than actually the attainable one that might be on the other side of, uh, of where we are now. Um, I, I, I actually gave a talk to Renault's electric vehicle conference the other week where we sang one of the most influential things that which happened in the car world was uh, an exhibition sponsored by General Motors in 1936 at the World's Fair in New York, which was called Futurama, not the cartoon. Um, and essentially what that did was planted the seeds of a car-based culture, which led partly to the ripping up of public transport infrastructure, you know, zoned cities, people zooming through cities on, on large flyovers and large, large roads. And I, in, in essence, we sort of need that cultural reimagination at scale right now uh, in order to create those compelling visions of where we could be um, if we just took the next step. I think you can see all the pieces. The quotes I always use is from William Gibson, who said, the future's out there, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And I'm a complete geek, as I'm sure some of us are on this event. And I can, I can draw you a map of where I think all the kind of elements which will be more mainstream in the future currently exist. What we haven't done is join all, all those dots together into something which people can really digest in a one-stop shop, which then takes them into a new way of thinking. 
yeah great thank you yeah yeah i'm a big believer of sort of imagining a more beautiful world before you can create it so yeah that really yeah. ties with that um alistair have you got a question yeah absolutely i was kind of thinking you know if you're going to go for one one thing there's so much content there um ed but uh, you know what's the one thing that's given this year one thing that's good this year it's given you hope this year in relation to action oh. on climate um i think the probable death of the commute um uh, and i think you know it's like it's like we had this madness uh going on where millions of us spent hours a day you know particularly uh in london but you know in any major city um often car based trotting back and forth uh to the office in a way that we could see we could see the weak signal of the future and the fact that there was a bit of more degree of flexible homeworking, but the amount of accumulated waste and stress and ill health and pollution and infrastructural impact um, that was thrown at perpetuating that madness, which was an orthodoxy that we never dared to question before. Um, and I think what has given me hope is the pandemic blew that up. Um, and there's no doubt that some commuting will come back um, and people will want to go into the office perhaps one or two days a week. And I say this in the context of obviously, I know that many key workers don't have an option. They have to travel to work. If you're working in a school or a hospital, that's not an option. But for many office-based workers, um, there's a sort of insanity about it. And I think the thing that gives me hope is, you know, you've, you've had that disruption of the status quo, which probably won't come back at the same scale uh, and will have huge amounts of positive benefits uh, for everyone as a result. Thank you, Ed. That is, uh, I think, the perfect segue onto the next bit of content. So um, I'm going to thank you for your contribution, bringing your voice to Plymouth and those people that dial into the stuff that's going on from the side. Um, uh, it has been true inspiration. Um, so thank you for your time. I hope you'll be joining us. I'm going to go and pick up my daughter. I'm going to go and pick up my daughter from school, unfortunately. So uh, I will have to say goodbye. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Enjoy the rest Maybe of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Thank thanks, Ed, for, for that um, amazing talk. And thanks, Chris, um, for your questions as well. Um, so on to the next presenter, um, who has probably the hardest job of the evening, uh, namely following Ed. Um, but I'm sure they're up to the challenge. And so please, can I introduce Alistair McPherson to talk about Plymouth Energy Community and their activities towards a zero carbon world. Welcome, Alistair. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I will introduce myself, so I won't do that again, but I'm here to talk about Plymouth Energy Community's work in the last, the last year, and to I want to draw a golden thread that um, stitches together our work in the enterprise sector with our work in the artistic sector and to um, tell us stop and pause on that journey a little way just to reflect a little bit on um, the impact that we've had in, in the last 12 months. So PEC, what are we? What are we about? We're a mission-led organisation, a purpose-led uh, charity, social enterprise. We're actually a family uh, of um, five uh, enterprises in one form or another. Um, our collective mission is to bring local people and organizations together to tackle fuel poverty um, and the climate crisis. Um, we believe fundamentally to increase local ownership and influence over the energy solutions. And we want to build confidence um, in those solutions and how the community can take control of them. And fundamentally, we want to help people to heat and power their homes in an affordable way. We're a people organization. So you know, the, the solution um, is not a technical one. Um, we've got the technological solutions to the climate crisis. And so we promise that we need people at a local level engaged in this to make it happen. And the community is a big part of it. So you know, it's in our name, but we are a community. We're, we're, we're a staff team. We're a, a team of directors and volunteers. And we're a team of um, you know, about 600 
with a support members and over 500 investors. Um, that team is core to, to what we do and the central strand and to how we work. So as PEC as a kind of entity, that's who we are, that's what we do, but what is it, what are our enterprising activities? Well, fundamentally, they fall into um, two, two areas in that we're trying to build community owned assets that have a role in the climate solution. So to date, we've been focused on renewable energy installations. Um, we've built out um, significant uh, levels of locally owned, clean, green energy deploying stuff, solar panels. Um, in solar farms and on roofs across the city. And we own and control 20% um, of the renewable energy generation that happens in Plymouth, over 20%. And so we're doing that um, and we're expanding that role into assets um, in terms of housing assets and community-led zero carbon housing solutions. So enterprise in that space and we enterprise in the space where we work with people um, in their homes to sort out and support them in one form or um, another around how they can make that home uh, warmer, more energy efficient, and how they can gather the um, health and financial well-being issues that come alongside those changes. So in the last year, yeah, we've been talking about homes and that's been a big, big thing for us is to move into the idea of community-led homes. And we're currently developing a project um, where we aim to build out 38 affordable net zero homes um, and something that is getting significant traction and interest. And we've got interest from um, uh, the Innovate UK who are now backing us with, with our ideas. We've got interest from Homes England and we've a strong partnership with the City Council to make that happen. So it's not only renewable energy assets that we're now kind of enterprising around, it is also now around zero carbon homes. So those are our enterprising areas of enterprise and within those areas, we have impact. And at this time of year, um, we take time to, to, to uh, do some sums, collect our data. We put our data geek hats on, um, you know, look at what our impact has been and compare that, um, uh, I guess, in terms of what we've done the previous year. And we share that impact statement with our investors and with our members and our supporters. And it's part of the purpose today is to, to, you know, to share that and to, to celebrate. So we're an organization that's not been around for very long and, you know, to be having these kind of numbers um, out front of us is really something we're very proud of. Um, so yeah, six, million you know six thousand million megawatt hours of um uh six hundred and ninety one thousand megawatt hours of clean energy produced from from our renewable energy assets so that's you know over 20 percent of the total renewable energy generated across the city and when you you know that is a small community energy organization having that kind of impact gives us significant hope of what way communities can shape the change in these cities need we've engaged with and work with nearly 3,000 households. Um, um, over 700 of those households have had like one-to-one -one support from us. And that one-to-one -one support has generated like 686,719 pounds worth of saved households. That is transformative. It's very easy to get um, bored by these numbers and then let you wash over you. So I just wanted to talk to um, couple of case studies that kind of unpick some of the kind of life-changing um, impacts that, that that can have. So first one I just wanted to highlight was um, Nuray. So Nuray contacted us about some challenges she had with her bill. She's a refugee, she's got language barriers which make it very hard to communicate with energy suppliers. So we worked with her through an interpreter to make sure she got the support she was entitled to, to and things like warm hand discount, the priority services register, all kind of to um, reduce the burden of that energy bill for somebody in her situation. But uh, language barriers had resulted in fuel debt, and so we mediated with her supplier to switch away. And with a payment plan in place and monthly payments met, it was clear that she was in a much better place in terms of um, that kind of initial ask. But our service went significantly went, went beyond that and through the conversations that we had with Nuray, it became very clear that you know a significant part of her monthly income was going out in optometry costs to her daughter who had a, a significant eye problem and so the work we did we take our you know energy conversation onto another level 
um, and to work with a charitable foundation to secure her 12 months of um, charitably funded eye care for her daughter. So now Nare can stay warm, afford her bills, and give her daughter the best chance of keeping her sight as she grows up. That's so much more impactful than that 686,000 number. The other one I wanted to share was Peter and June, who called us about their cold, damp home. They'd spent money trying to solve the problem, but nothing had worked and they still had a significant problem. So we visited them and we were able to arrange um, some expert help in there and we installed a solution that got rid of the damp. Yeah, that's what we do. We're an energy charity, so of course, that's what we do. But energy is always the start of the conversation to help, you know, help further. For us, that's a big part of what we're proud of. So through those extra conversations, we learned that June hadn't been working because of ill health and there was no benefits coming in. And so you know, there was a significant kind of struggle with it, their monthly budget. So over the next few months, our energy advisors campaigned hard and we helped them to apply for welfare benefits. Just last month, month we got um, confirmation that they were going to see they had secured an additional six hundred and five pounds a month, and that six hundred and five pounds a month additional income to them was secured for the next 10, 10 years. That's a seventy thousand pound life changing event. So that allows Peter to give up his job and do come June's full time carer. So that's life changing. So energy is part of the conversation we do, but the social and, and well-being benefits that we drive are very, very significant. Too. So that's our impact. Last year, say as carbon, as generation, as our numbers health, but actually that's the real story that we, we, we're unlocking here about how, you know, energy around, our know, conversations around energy unlock lots of other things where we can support where others can't. So what's art got to do with all this? How does that help? Can I move past that one? So we're a community organisation and we recognise that a lot of the conversations that we have around energy and the climate chases are quite technical and quite geeky and not very accessible. And so we've been talking for a while about the role that art can play in making, you know, connecting with people in different ways. And we did this a number of years back with a project called um, Cold Realities. Um, had huge, and we took that, um, well, we started that with a view to engaging different people um, with conversations around fuel poverty. And we took that to over 25 different events. We took that to um, the Houses of Parliament. It went to the Scottish Houses of Parliament. We took it to uh, national conferences. We took it to European fuel poverty forums. We took it to the local government association. It was at the National Energy Action, UK BASH, European Forum on Social Quality. And that had reached over 2,500 people from, you know, from the event, you know, if effectively us just taking the opportunity to, to capture what was going on in fuel poor homes in Flint. And so that segues through to what we're doing now in that, you know, we've now got a campaign and Jenny's going to talk about this a little bit more about like taking our message on the urgency change, taking our message from Plymouth and the wider Southwest and the community energy sector, taking that message to Glasgow in the form of the huge art installation. So we've been working with Art and Energy for over the last year um, to bring some momentum behind that. And we're currently raising funds towards that, which you'll about later. You know, that's, that's hugely exciting. It's gaining a huge significant momentum and it really does expand you know, the reach that we can have and, and that the conversations that we can have around energy and climate. So just in the last year, we're calculating that we've reached 3,000 new people through that, 3,000 new people that wouldn't otherwise been having a conversation around this kind of stuff. So that's a link to the Plymouth Climate Challenge Fund. So we're currently raising funds for that. Um, Jenny's going to talk a little bit about more about that after me. Uh, but you know, that is about trying to get £25,000 together through the Plymouth Climate Challenge Fund. Plymouth City Council are effectively offering some um, for that. And so we're in a kind of little competition with other kind of crowd funders locally um, uh, to raise um, the most, as much as we can this month. Um, so 
please do during the course of this evening go to the Plymouth Crowdfunder to site uh, the link will be the end make a pledge there's some amazing rewards and some artistic kind of gifts that can be made and some um, ways you can put activity in fun so it's all about building momentum it's all about engaging in new ways um, and that's a big part of why we're here this evening talking about art and enterprise so I think that's it from me I'm going to hand on now to I've got my little stick here, which I can go like this across and hand over seamlessly to the one, <laughs> one of the, the only air system who um, we have been working with. Jenny's uh, an artist um, um, that works in glass. She's also a member of Plymouth Energy Community. She's come through the Plymouth Energy Community's Peck Pal scheme, which is where we effectively try and coach and nurture people to take, take action. Um, and um, she's now working with us as a director of um, in Art and Energy and as part of Art and Energy Collective. So, anything more? I'm going to hand over to Jenny. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny from Art and Energy. Um, the three of us in this photo here are just kind of the, the central core of Art and Energy. We're actually a collective. Um, a very informal kind of group of technologists, educationalists, artists, tinkerers. Basically, you could all be, we would love to invite you all to be part of the Art and Energy Collective, um, because just by being here this evening, it shows that you, you have a concern and you share a concern for the state of our world. Um, and we are approaching that through an artistic way. Um, so we're using creativity to generate conversation about energy use and ultimately to lead to behaviour change towards a greener and fairer world. So I'm going to start with a short overview of our organisation and then move on to the Moths to a Flame project that we're working on in partnership with PEC. So we began by thinking about solar panels um, and that they're an increasing part of our world, and that's fantastic. Uh, but the way that they're aesthetic, it often results in people objecting to them. For some, these dark blacky blue squares are just plain boring and uninspiring, whilst others passionately and vocally object to our countryside being homogenized by geometric industry. Now, these responses are largely due to the aesthetics, and that's a barrier to appreciating this fantastic technology, judging the book by its cover, if you like. So we began a lengthy research project. Did you know, for example, that solar cells come in a range of beautiful colors, that they can be cut to intricate shapes and that the glass surface onto which they are built can be embellished through engraving and etching. And throughout this process, we worked with one of our other directors, Katie Shanks, a researcher at the University of Exeter's Environment and Sustainability Institute, and she tested the effect of the efficiency of the cells. Now, the standard blue squares are by far and away the most efficient, but colour and cutting didn't seem to have as big an impact as you might think and sandblasting the surface actually can increase the efficiency, which is really exciting. But as artists, we're less interested in the numbers as much as the emotive response than a, that an object has. And so this is the first of our solar artworks. Uh, Chloe made this piece, Dawn Breaks. In fact, to our knowledge, it's the first solar artwork to be created in the UK. This is actually one of the rewards for our crowdfunder but more on that later. It contains, oops, sorry, go back one. It contains um, two different colors of solar cell, cut to shape and with a painted mask to hide the wiring. I hope you agree that it's a thing of beauty. Now we've exhibited this and other solar artworks at a number of events and audiences have found them attractive, intriguing and desirable. But what makes it really exciting is that when placed in sunlight, it creates 12 volts of electricity. And with a little step down converter on the back, this will charge a USB device. I personally find this so exciting. For most of us, solar, pal solar panels are very much out of reach on roofs, um, behind fences, in solar arrays, in fields. And in fact, a lot of work goes into making them less visible. But we at Art and Energy feel that renewable energy is this amazing technology that's already making a huge difference to our planet. And so it should be celebrated. I first came across Art and Energy at a session they ran with PEC and Plymouth College of Art Fab Lab in 2018, where we were encouraged to imagine an energy artwork for Plymouth, something that would generate awareness of the energy that so many of us take for granted. 
The idea is that by becoming aware, we start to ask questions and to make positive conscious changes to our energy use and behavior. Now, this particular artwork that we were thinking about is yet to be created, but the two hour workshop totally opened my mind and I now look at the world through a, a very different lens. Since then, we've run a number of solar artwork making sessions and each time I've witnessed the same thing. So participants arrive with a preconceived idea that solar panels are complicated in the realm of industry. Then they realize that they're actually surprisingly simple in their construction. And then the utter joy and amazement when their solar panel creates a charge and even more so when they plug a device in. So plugging in a mobile phone and your mobile phone goes ping and you know that the, the soldering and the whole process that you've gone through over what is quite a lengthy day and quite frustrating at times has created uh, an object that can charge your mobile phone or light a light bulb or, you know, it's just amazing. Um, and the magic of creativity really does break through barriers. So one topic at the heart of art and energy, which is what we've been talking about, um, Ed and Al have both been talking about, is this ethos um, about the climate emergency and the need for us as a species to change our behavior, to reduce the damage we're inflicting on our planet. Now this thought process can be unhealthfully all consuming, leading to overwhelming levels of anxiety that in turn lead to inactivity and the inability to see a positive route forward. I personally have definitely been in that place a number of times over the years. Eco-anxiety can be a really lonely situation to find yourself in. Feeling like you're the only one or one of very few who can hear the alarm bells, but feeling that as an individual, you have no power to bring about change. And we've found that creativity can be so very helpful in breaking down that anxiety barrier, offering a positive and hopeful route forward. So when we heard that COP26 was coming to the UK for the first time ever, we felt that it was vital that we, the normal little people, be represented and have a voice that might just reach the ears of world leaders and um, industry and, and people who have the power to bring about that change and encourage us all to, to make those changes. And so we talked to our friends at PEC and they agreed. And so Moths to a Flame as a project was born for a while, we've been thinking about the moth's notoriously difficult relationship with light as being similar to our own complex relationship with energy. Did you know that the collective noun for a group of moths is a whisper? Well, our idea is to collect the many whispers of hope that we all have as individuals and turn those into a roar for change. We launched, launched last November and were overwhelmed by the response we received. The plan was to run a series of community and school workshops to decorate thousands of UV laser cut moths. These would form a mass participatory art installation in the Glasgow Botanic Gardens to coincide with COP26, now basically. But then of course COVID arrived, cancelling our workshops and postponing COP, difficult times. In actual fact, with a grant from the Arts Council, continued support from PEC and some wonderful volunteers from the Devon Moth Group, 2020 has been an opportunity to reach more people as we've introduced some new digital artworks. We commissioned an augmented reality colouring sheet. You print it off, colour it in with your design, use a mobile phone or tablet to bring it to life and record your whisper of hope to share with us. This is Ollie and Erin in the garden colouring in their moth to bring to life. My hope for the future is that people will be kinder to our planet by polluting it less. We've also run a series of free Zoom sessions called Watch Moths. These are double bill events featuring a mixture of art activities and energy advice. On the Friday evening, we join our mothers as they set up their moth traps, then return on the Saturday to see who's visited. I certainly had no idea how amazing and varied moths are, and this is linked beautifully to learning more about ecology and our dependence on the sun's energy. We also commissioned our collective member Matt Harvey to write a poem for Moths to a Flame, and unexpectedly some of our Zoom audience were inspired to write their own poems. So in the spring we will be holding a poetry slam of moth and energy inspired poems 
please do encourage friends, family, and, and pop pen to paper yourself and send us your words. In September, we exhibited our new artwork at Plymouth Art Weekender. This is an installation in the Caterpillar Room at the plot on Union Street. It was accompanied by an atmospheric soundtrack. This is a small version of what we plan to take to Glasgow. Now, with social distancing, we obviously couldn't get hands-on creative at the event, but we had lots of things for people to take away, including a free activity pack with craft ideas, drawing activities and word games. And included in the free packs was a copy of A Moth's Whisper, a beautiful illustrated storybook written especially for us by the lovely Miranda Barlow. It tells the story of Marnie, the yellow underwing moth, who's confused by all the bright lights at night and is one, is one of the rewards for our pledges for our crowdfunder. So that brings me nicely on to our crowdfunder. Now we're raising funds to continue our work in Plymouth and further afield. With another year until COP26, we have the potential to reach a lot more people. This project really is relevant to anyone who switches on a light or plugs in an electrical device. We need to empower everyone to make changes, especially world leaders. We're using creativity to give people a chance to slow down and think, to reconnect with the world around them, opening the door to further thought and ultimately constructive action. Pledges to our crowdfunder can choose from rewards ranging from sponsorship of a solar panel at the Peck Ernestettle Solar Array to receiving a copy of the Moth's Whisper or a creative pack to decorate your own UV moth for the installation an art by, artwork by one of the Art and Energy Collective members, or even your very own solar artwork to hang on your wall and use to charge your devices. So I'd really like to encourage you to um, get involved, um, contact us with your ideas, encourage friends, family and your wider networks to get involved with the, the Moths to a Flame project. There's all sorts of, of fun ways to do so. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Art and Energy. Um, it's really exciting times. Whenever there's a kind of crowdfunder running or you're raising money in this way um, from you know, the crowd or from the community, um, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you know, there's, there's a bit of warmth that kind of warms up inside me as, as you see people starting pledging support for your ideas. And um, the, fund, the crowdfunder is, is going really well. Um, and we're really pleased to have got just under 10% in the first few weeks um and yeah uh, we're really hoping that there will be some two things that listeners tonight will do um one is to to pledge um and if you if you can't pledge um please do share so next up um we have who's next is it chris or is it paul it's paul the legend that is the hardman now i've worked with paul for quite a long period of time i'm now we've been working with him in the fact that a trustee of Plymouth Energy Community, as well as his in some, not in substantive roles at the University of Stainworth Institute and Low Carbon Gala. Um, so I'm going to hand you quickly over to Mr. Paul Hardman um, to tell you all about the SEI. That's great. Thanks, Al. And um, hi again, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Paul Hardman and I'm manager of the Sustainable Earth Institute. Matt, sorry, could you just increase the um, bandwidth a little bit, please? That would be great because I can't uh, see the slides. But um, so um, I'm going to spend the next nine minutes or so talking to you about the Sustainable Earth Institute and also um, art for a zero carbon world. So what we're doing within the Institute around this, this area. Um, and before I start, I would like to thank um, Heather Nunn. Um, Heather um, is a graduate from university, graduated in fine art, and she developed this artwork that we're using um, to promote the event and is, is behind our heads uh, uh, during the, the webinar at the moment. Um, Heather's got a really interesting practice where she takes um, uh, uh, waste and um, rubbish from a uh, beach cleans and uses that to develop collagraphs and develop these fantastic prints that are here. So thanks, Heather. In terms of the Institute, well, what do we do? Well, we bring researchers together with businesses, community groups and individuals 
and we work collaboratively on projects that deliver positive impact towards a sustainable earth. So we're all about research, collaboration and impact. And in terms of our priorities, well, we work globally and we tend to frame our research around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we also work locally where our capabilities can make a difference. So who are we? Well, we're over 300 researchers from a variety of disciplines. We cut across the whole of the university and we include disciplines from science, engineering, arts, humanities, health, business, and education. And you'll see here just a selection of some of those disciplines um, within the boxes. So you can see we've got a very broad base of disciplines across the university. And we've also got a broad base of activities around um, arts. And so just naming some of these from our, our two schools, from the School of Art, Design and Architecture and the School of Humanities and Performing Arts, you can see that we've got expertise in architecture, 3D design, built environment, digital media, fine art, illustration, filmmaking, graphic design, anthropology, art history, dance and performance, English and creative writing, photography, publishing, history and music. So you can see a broad range of, of areas of activities that we work in. And a large majority, a big proportion of those um, are working in sustainability and um, climate change. To give you an example of one of those areas, if we take one of those, those boxes, so English and creative writing, um, we've got a lecturer, David Sargent, who's really interested in utopian and dystopian futures. And I'm not sure if he's, he's on the call today, but I'm sure he'll be interested in, in hearing what Ed said about, about that as well. Um, and David's also a poet and, and, for example, has had a climate change poem um, published by The Guardian. Um, ben Smith is another um, English lecturer who had his debut novel um, published last year. Um, I don't know if it's um, around um, energy punk, um, uh, uh, um, but uh, it's definitely around climate change. Um, and so Ben and David um, have also published a, a digital magazine last month, which uh, brings together voices from across the literary world and how these voices can respond to climate change. So I encourage you to, to go to that digital magazine as shown in the URL um, down the bottom of the slide. As well as promoting and supporting individual disciplines across the university, what the, university, what the Institute is about is, is collaboration and bringing together all those different disciplines. One example of this is some work that we've done with REBA and various other built environment professional bodies. Um, we've developed a six month webinar series. Um, the second of those um, is on tomorrow evening, all around the climate emergency and the built environment. And in terms of the university, um, we, we have um, presentations throughout the next six months from a variety of disciplines, including planning, architecture, environmental science, creative industries, power electronics. So a whole host of um, different disciplines that we've brought together around this challenge of climate emergency and the built environment. Another initiative that we have that brings together different disciplines is our Creative Associates Initiative. And this brings together researchers with creative industry organizations external to the university. And this is to develop novel and innovative ways of communicating our research and also enabling us to get our research out to new audiences as well. And so I've picked out three examples from some work we've done over the last few years around um, climate change. Um, so for example, on the left-hand side, um, Paul Lunt, um, who's an environmental scientist, has worked with real world visuals to develop an animation that looks at carbon sequestration in peatland on Dartmoor. Mandy Bloomfield from English has worked with Andy Hughes to develop a Machinima film around plastic and also climate change. Um, the Machinima um, uses uh, Grand Theft Auto and um, 
uh, well, in this particular match, he uses Grand Theft Auto and, and footage from the video game to enable a film to be developed. Um, and also Catherine Willis, who's um, in architecture, has worked with uh, One Polygon to develop digital games, augmented reality, virtual reality, and digital visualization around the smart cities agenda. Um, Ian Dijkstra from Geology has also worked with real world visuals. And this is an example of how we've managed to reach new audiences. So this particular video um, has had more than 150 news items from a variety of different well-known people, um, as well as over 80,000 YouTube views. Now, I can't show you the, the full video, um, which also includes um, putting a smartphone in a blender. Um, but if I show you now just the, the animation side of things, um, but feel free to, to look um, at the full video on YouTube. So if I show that now to you, um, and Matt, if you can start. Okay, great. So on to my final slide. Um, and just to let you know that um, we've been successful in getting some further funding to run another call of our Creative Associates program. And this year we are theming it around the climate emergency. So if you are a sustainability researcher or a creative organisation and you're interested in getting involved, please do come along to our workshop, which is taking place on the 30th of November. And the link is down there and it will be shown at the end of the webinar. OK, so back over to you, Al. Thank you, Paul. It's brilliant. Really good to hear that. And I can think of a few people that might be wanting to uh, sign up for your next Creative Associates program. Next, right. next I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Chris Woodfield, who is also on my left over here. And Chris is um, the Knowledge Exchange Officer with um, the Low Carbon Devon Project and here to tell us about the support they can they can provide for SMEs on their low carbon journey. So I'm going to hand you without further ado to Chris. Thank you. Chris. Great. Yeah. Cheers, Al. And thanks, Paul, as well. So my name is Chris Woodfield and I am the Knowledge Exchange Officer for the Low Carbon Devon Project. So I'm based within the Sustainable Earth Institute. Uh, so I work directly with Paul, who has just spoken. And I'm going to be talking about the Low Carbon Devon Project. And this is one of many projects within the Institute. And I'm just going to highlight what that is, and but also 
home in on the knowledge exchange aspect and then the low carbon Devon internship program. So what is it then? So it's an exciting new opportunity here in Devon. So it's focused on catalyzing action towards a low carbon economic growth. And it's focused directly on engaging with SMEs, so small and medium sized enterprises and tackling climate change. So taking this huge global challenge, but looking at what we can do locally in a practical and solutions focused way. And it's got four main areas. So I'm just going to talk through each of these four areas in turn. So the first one is this beautiful building here on the right. So it's the refurb of the university building into the sustainability hub. So this is a thriving collaborative space for local groups, social enterprises, students, academics, members of the public to come together and utilize this space. And then we have the carbon reduction project as a whole. So not just focusing on that one building, but looking at what we can do across the university estate to reduce our carbon emissions, such as LED lighting and other buildings, for example. And then we have the third component, which is focused on research and innovation. So it's looking at these four areas here listed. So we have a member of staff who's working on each of these four areas, looking at using the sustainability hub as a testing ground, as a living lab, but also engaging with local organizations in these four areas. And then the knowledge exchange aspect is focused on delivering a series of events like this one, but also the low carbon Devon internship opportunity. So I'm just going to expand on that over the next couple of slides. So it's a three month work placement, placing current students and recent graduates within Devon based enterprises and it's fully funded by the project and it's to work on a low carbon project. So it's a really exciting opportunity. And alongside that work experience, we'll be delivering a series of change leadership and personal development workshops. So these are weekly or bi-weekly workshops focused on upskilling the interns. And the approach I'm taking for this is really focused around how can we provide an innovative internship program our students with the tools, knowledge, confidence and inspiration to be active change makers. So it's this workshop or this work experience combined with these leadership workshops. And framing that is the what, the why and the how. So really looking at what needs to change and why, but how do we solve problems creatively? because business as usual isn't good enough and we really need to transform the way that we do things in a way which inspires change and where better to do that than locally here in Devon with our young leaders. Framework for these workshops is focused around something called the Plymouth Compass. So this has been developed over the past couple of years here at the university and the workshops will focus in on each aspect of the compass. And wouldn't it be amazing if all of our students left university with these future facing attributes. And these workshops will also involve things like design thinking, facilitation skills, listening, different leadership styles, conflict resolution, things like this, as well as that knowledge of the circular economy and donor economics, the planetary boundaries, and as Paul mentioned, the sustainable development goals. So not just what the goals are, but how can we practically implement them locally? So this is the SDG Action Manager, and it's a free tool that local organizations can use to track their progress against the SDGs. So it's about empowering the interns with this knowledge and then giving them an opportunity to put it into practice locally through their work experience. And it's also introducing things like the B Corp, so using business as a force for good. And this is just one of many environmental and social certification standards that businesses can achieve. So to sum up the internship program, then it's really an opportunity and a space for the interns to develop their own passions, employability and transferable skills, as well as growing as sustainable global citizens, whilst taking action on a local project. This is being launched at the moment 
being run in cohorts, so starting next February, and then being run throughout the year at different times, and then this repeated into 2022 as well. So it's really about practical solutions focused action combined with leadership development. And at the moment, I'm actively looking for Devon based enterprises to take part. So if you know of anyone, or if you're in the audience, or you'd like to get in touch with me if you're a student or a local organization who'd like to partner with this, some of the workshops I mentioned, then please do get in touch. I'd really love to hear from you. So as a whole then, I've just given you a brief outline of the Low Carbon Devon project and then homed in on the Low Carbon Devon internship opportunity. And just to pause before we finish, I just wanna finish on this notion of, are we being good ancestors? So how do we think long-term in a short-term world? And this diagram that I'm gonna show is taken from this book, The Good Ancestor. And I'll just talk you through it. And that green dot towards the top there, is 7.7 billion. So that's the current population. And then above that is the gray dot, which says 100 billion. So that's the past 50,000 years how many people have lived and died. And then projecting that same time scale forward is represented by that orange dot there. And that says unborn generations. So in the next 50,000 years, that's how many people are estimated to be born. And it, as you can see, it's orders of magnitude bigger. It's way bigger than the other two dots. So for me, that really highlights the opportunity that lays ahead and really puts it into context that our actions today will have a huge impact, not just on the number of people yet to be born, but on their quality of life. And that is a really exciting opportunity. It's uncertain, yes, but I think we need to embrace that uncertainty with a sense of courage, compassion, and creativity. And where better to do that than where we are right now, place-based change. So this is Plymouth. So if you're in Plymouth or Devon or wherever you are in the world, local action really does make a difference. And for me, all the best stuff happens on the edge. And Plymouth from the Southwest is definitely on the edge. It's this amazing space where land meets the sea. And it's a perfect mixing spot of creativity, innovation, and practical action. So I really encourage you to get in touch with me if you wanna partner on any of the stuff that I mentioned and really make it happen here so we can co-create and collaborate a thriving future where we can all flourish. So thank you for listening and please do get in touch. My email address is here and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we know in the audience, we've got a, a big gang of uh, social enterprises and tuned in tonight. So I'm sure there'll be some inquiries coming your way from those that could do with some extra support. And it's fantastic to see those kind of opportunities being made uh, for uh, graduates and um, recent graduates coming through the scheme and to get those kind of skills and uh, I guess leg up as they move into the world of work. So. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Al. That time when uh, it's time to say thank you um, to uh, all the speakers um, and to really find my uh, notes. There we go. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, uh, we've had a fantastic attendance this evening. And so we very much hope that you leave this evening feeling uh, with a little bit more hope. Um, and more confident uh, that the mission is possible and you're a bit clearer about the role you could play in it. So thank you very much, Paul, um, the SEI, Jenny, Chris, and um, those that made this happen that are all in the background, um, especially Hayley, Kat, and the guys at First Sight Media that made this make me look way more slick than it would have been if it was on um, Zoom. Um, our final word uh, will come back to uh, the art and energy theme this evening, and we just want to um, run our video in relation to the crowdfunder. Um, it, it is important for us um, to take um, our voice to Glasgow 
um, and the crowdfunder is the opportunity for you um, uh, to, to help that and participate in that in one form or another. Crowdfunding works, um, the name's in the title, by the basis of the crowd. So we've got 100 people listening in tonight. So each of those 100 um, tell, tell another 10. That's 1,000 people. We know that 1,000 people visit that site and the normal conversion ratios, we will raise um, 1,500 pounds. Simple, simple. So that would take us up. Plymouth Energy Community wants to see a fair, affordable and zero carbon energy system for everyone. But we're in a climate emergency and the system that we have is broken. From fuel poverty to rising emissions, we need to take action. The voice of Plymouth should be heard by world leaders at the International Climate Conference in Glasgow in 2021. We're part of the Art and Energy Collective and the money you give will fund Moths to a Flame. A whole year of free creative activities in Plymouth resulting in a mass participation art installation to represent you at the conference. Together we'll explore our relationship with energy and the world around us. Get hands-on with solar art and renewables. Make thousands of moths that will carry your words and record your hopes for a better energy future. Most importantly of all, we'll find our own power to influence the change we need. You can show your support by... Adopting a solar panel in Plymouth's very own solar system. By making beautiful moths to join our whisper in flight to Glasgow or by coming along on a moth-watching expedition. However you choose to take part, your voice matters. So please, help us to help you get your message directly to those who can make the changes that we need. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you um, enjoyed this evening. Thank you for your time and attending. Thank you for supporting us. And uh, I have nothing else to say other than good night, stay safe and uh, enjoy your evening.